Gene, thanks for joining us. Uh, appreciate you taking the time and uh, spending a little time talking about DevOps. Oh man, delighted to be here. <laughs> so let's get started and tell us a little bit about yourself because obviously I know you well and uh, we want to have everybody else kind of get to know you a little bit better, although a lot of folks out there know who you are, but give us you know, a few, few minutes on, on your background. Yeah, um, I have been studying high-performing technology organizations since 1999, and so this journey started for me when I was the CTO and founder of a company called Tripwire, where I was there for 13 years, and the most surprising part of my journey was that it took me straight into the heart of the DevOps movement, which I think is urgent and important. And so for me, uh, the funnest part of my life right now is being able to study how these unicorns work. So the unicorns are organizations like you know, Twitter, Amazon, Google, Etsy, Netflix, you know, who are all doing incredibly fast flow of work. I right? mean, they're doing hundreds or even thousands of deployments per day while preserving world-class reliability and stability, which is something that you know, I think many of us believe wasn't actually possible. You could get fast flow features in production or you could get stability and reliability, never both. And yet, the DevOps organizations are showing that you know you can actually get both, which is the reason why I think DevOps is so exciting. That's great. So, I mean, when you were studying these high-performance organizations and systems, was there an aha moment for you around DevOps where you just sort of said, oh my gosh, this, this is going to work, or this is it, I, I've seen the future. And you know, tell us what that was, if there was one. Yeah, I think one of the, there's really two aha moments for me. Uh, one was in 1999 when we noticed that these uh, organizations that had the best project due date performance, the best stability and availability, the best security and the best posture compliance, they were the organizations where security and operations could work together to achieve a common goal as opposed to being at each other's throats all the time. And so working with the Software Engineering Institute, uh, the language that uh, I learned is that these are boundary spanners. These are where you know, security and operations can work together. Uh, the problem is that you know, we all believe that there was a huge business value of this. And yet the problem that we saw was that operations and information security often got over-delegated. It was viewed as a tactical uh, function whereas development was a strategic function that uh, got all the executive's attention. Uh, and the problem is that what we often saw was that development was passing you know, fragile, problematic code downstream where technical debt would accrue. And so my, uh, that led to the second aha moment in 2006 and 2007 for me, which was you know, working with organizations like AOL and Yahoo and Microsoft, where uh, we saw that you know, there was this downward spiral. You know, we still saw the same downward spiral that affected dev, operations and information security and there was this better way of working and I still remember a gentleman named Eric Passmore he was a senior vice president of engineering at AOL he said holy cow you know when it took the IT operations team at AOL nine months to upgrade from the Linux kernel from 2.4 to 2.6 it was like a code freeze for development for nine months because they needed you know the multi-threading capability and he said that's not an operations problem that's not a development problem. That is a business problem, right? This is my boss's biggest, biggest problem. And so for me, that was this huge aha moment. It really showed what the true business value of having great operations is. It's not just to get stability and reliability, but it's to enable fast flow of features into production. And it's how to help the organization win. Yeah, so that, that makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, one of the comments you just said is that the developers are sort of viewed as strategic and the, the security folks and the operations folks are, are viewed as tactical. So tell me, how should, how should the ops and security folks and just everybody in the community start to learn about DevOps and think of themselves as much more strategic? How do, how do we shift that conversation? Yeah, I mean, I think there's uh, at least three things. Uh, one is for people downstream in operations and information security, uh, you know, the one thing I want everyone to know is that, you know, when there's DevOps, a culture of DevOps values uh, in place, they are w waiting for you with open arms. That, you know, the only way you can get fast flow, you know, without causing massive chaos and disruption downstream is you need more than developers. You need tests, you need operations, you need InfoSec, all part of the tribe in, in order to make it so. So one is, you know, uh, let's not view DevOps as an existential threat that's going to ace us out of the game, right? right. Instead, let's view it as this opportunity where they're asking for our skill sets, and you know the ideal reaction of those interactions is, you know, thank you, <laughs> thank you for you know helping define these non-functional requirements so that we can actually deploy without having it you know mowed down in production, uh, because you can't be available if you're not secure. Uh, I think the second um, thing that I would love every operations 
and security person to know is that um, is that there's contributions that we can make in terms of um, you know how to improve the quality of the code and the quality of the environment. Um, you know, increasingly our contribution is not necessarily the, the security audit at the end of the project. It's not um, you know uh, in the operations you know trying to get all the non-function requirements uh, you know right before for the deployment. Instead, it's being a part of that team where we can specify what that is and jointly own those responsibilities with development. Um, and so that we can you know, make, make meaningful uh, improvements long before the big production deployment. Um, and I think the third thing is uh, that I would want every ops and infosec person to know is that the science is actually showing us that uh, you know, this is true. This is not just a platitude. This is not just a philosophy. Um, I work with an organization called Puppet Labs. We benchmarked 4,000 organizations in 2012 and 9,600 organizations in 2013. And we're finding that those organizations embracing DevOps patterns you know, are significantly outperforming the non-high performers. They're doing 30 times more frequent code deployments. Uh, they, have, they can complete the work 8,000 times faster. Wow. And they get far better outcomes. Uh, you know, when they do a production deploy or a production change, um, they fail half as frequently. And when things do blow up, they can fix it 12 times faster. So it really does show that you, know, you can be more agile and more reliable and secure at the same time. In fact, you actually need both. Yeah, I mean, those are amazing numbers. I mean, it, that's staggering that, uh, that people are doing those, those kinds of improvements with DevOps. So from your perspective, I mean, there's a lot of people who are still like saying, hey, DevOps is sort of this movement that's happening. It sounds like in your mind, you're saying th it's not going to be optional for people pretty soon. It's just every organization is going to run with DevOps. Is that kind of your belief? Yeah, I, I, my, it's my, that is absolutely my belief, right? I think, uh, you know, the biggest aha moment for me in the last year and a half is that it's not just the unicorns that are adopting DevOps. There's also the horses, too. You know, so it's, you know, across every industry vertical, you know, financial services, you know, like, uh, uh, for example, Bank of America, uh, BNP Pariba, it's retailers like Macy's and Nordstrom, you know, it's entertainment companies like Disney, you know, there's, and, and government organizations like the UK government and the US Department of Homeland Security. All of these organizations are embracing DevOps. And I think the reason is that the business value of embracing DevOps is, you know, larger than we ever thought. And that regardless of, you know, what industry we're competing in, whether it's profit or not for profit, profit, you know the the organizational advantage that DevOps brings to bear is uh, is worth it. And so, I, I think I guess the, what it means for operations and infosec is that my genuine belief is that those people who can't and teams that can't figure out how to operate in these massively accelerated tempos uh, are you know we risk irrelevance in five or ten years. Yep. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, uh, I mean. If you're thinking about it from this sort of strategic business perspective, how do how do these technical folks, you know, how does a a senior technical person or even you know um, you know an individual contributor at an organization convince management to go go use DevOps or embrace DevOps? I mean, what are the things that the technical folks can do to speak sort of a, a business language around it? Yeah, I, I think one of them, and by the way, I'm just suddenly now reminded of our mutual friend Brad Feld saying, you know, he, it's very important for him uh, that, you know, portfolio companies of his are using DevOps because right. of the competitive advantage it brings to bear. Uh, you know, I think from the technology perspective, which is actually where the work happens, um, you know, I think from an operations and security perspective, you know, I think it, you know, means that, you know, increasingly we have to be able to speak the language of development. And so that means... Uh, understanding concepts like continuous delivery, continuous test, continuous build, and if the development group isn't there, then we have to help. Um, and so, once those practices are in place, then it actually become it actually increases the organization's ability to get work done. So, it actually increases um, the amount of cycles being spent on information security. Um, I think the second practice that I love is uh, comes from a product management domain. Uh, there's a gentleman named Marty Kagan, who's a hero in the product management space. He says every product owner, product manager, should take 20% of the cycles off the table from the you know, uh, project teams. They're not for product owners to spend. It's for dev and ops 
and infosec to spend however they best see fit. So it means working on things besides features, <laughs> things yep. like stability, reliability, security, um, deployability. And so I think uh, you know just having that kind of budget uh, in terms of cycles to work on things creates this incredible conversation between DevOps and infosec. I'm like, what can we do to improve you know, the quality of the code environments that we're putting into production? Yeah, and it's the folks that know the code best and, and the product best sort of at the technical level that are deciding how to spend that 20%. So uh, you would hope that that would be really, um, really well spent time uh, to improve the product. You, you know, I, it really, uh, I, I think that's so true. And I think one of the uh, things that I always am amazed by when I'm studying high-performing DevOps organizations is the sense of team. So I think kind of in the uh, especially in larger enterprise organizations, you know, you have a centralized IT operations uh, running as a shared service that's you know potentially serving you know tens or even hundreds of application teams. You know, I think increasingly we're migrating to a model where uh, the operations staff and infosec staff are now embedded in the product teams, yep. and so uh, now we're genuinely operating as part of a team that's helping you know the service or product achieve its goals. You know, as opposed to being stuck at the end where we're the shrill, hysterical voice <laughs> <laughs> trying to get people to do what they don't want to do, right? And so yeah. I think that's a complete game changer in terms of mentality. I think you're right. So, so last question, and then we'll, we'll let you go. And we really appreciate you spending time with us. Um, so people that are going to hear this um, and see this video, what are, they, what are three things maybe that they could – walk out the door and do in their organization to help them become a DevOps organization or improve their, their organization? You know, kind of high-level question, but, you know, how can we give people something actionable that they can go, go run with when, when they leave this, uh, this video? You know, what we're finding in the science is that as we're studying high performers and then not high performers, <laughs> uh, you know, there's certain behaviors that every high performer is doing that none of the low performers are doing. And those two things are, you know, is operations and information security, you know, are they checking in all the production artifacts into version control, ideally in the same repository as development. And so that means that we can reproduce the production environment, you know, based only on what's in version control as opposed to just in our heads. Right. The second thing that we found uh, in every high performer that was universally absent in the lower performers was, you know, is there an automated code deployment process, which includes being able to create environments on demand. So this means increasingly operation and security, um, you know, our job is not to do the work that shows up in the work tickets. Instead, it's create the automation mechanism so that, you know, developers can deploy code on demand and that developers can get environments on demand whenever they need it. That's secure, stable, that's well-known, that's uh, fit for use in production. And so, uh, you know, I think information security and operations should view this as a tremendous opportunity to help developers be productive, get to what they need done, and simultaneously increase the stability, reliability, and security of this code in production. Um, and I think the third thing I would recommend is you know, any place where there's a production checklist, uh, where there's you know, things that we would do at the end of the project, increasingly that should be a part of an automated test that's actually being run every day as a part of the deployment pipeline. So. Any place where we can, you know, build unit tests, uh, integration tests, uh, that's not just for development. That's for ops and security as well. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, one of the things that we've talked about at Jump Cloud a lot is um, how do you embed, you know, different, different pieces into the process. So, you know, for instance, security pieces into the process versus having it be sort of this adjunct at the end. So it makes a lot of sense. And um, thank you for the time, Gene. I know you're busy, but we really appreciate you spending a few minutes with us. Oh, no. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll make sure that uh, all the links that we talk about, uh, we can put that, uh, I'll, I'll send that to you as well. Okay, great. Yeah, and we'll, we'll include them in, uh, in the post and everybody can go to them. So thanks very much. Thank you. Okay.